Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for being here. We're very excited to welcome Andy Jorgensen, Professor of Chemistry from the University of Toledo in Ohio, and also Jack and Maureen's college friend. So yeah, we're very excited to see your presentation and hear what you have to tell us about climate change and the environment and what the future has to hold for us. So thanks, Andy. Um, I'll just let you take it away. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to include several uh, questions, some trivia questions uh, with right and wrong answers and some with um, uh, opinion P. So there's not right and wrong. There's some better informed than others. Uh, and when I give these talks, I usually have one, if you can see, I don't know if you can see me or not, have these little clicker things and uh, uh, people can respond. And I'm going to show you at the end some results, a study I do on uh, how people's ideas change after getting uh, one lecture, if you will, one presentation on climate change. My premise is, so I'm a physical chemist, environmental chemist, but I also uh, did a, a postdoc in chemical education at University of Illinois. And uh, so I'm interested in how people learn, and this is something I do. So climate change, a fundamental challenge for the future of all who live in the world. Outline to the talk, uh, causes of climate change. By the way, I presume you can hear me okay, that you tell me if you can't. Uh, causes of Everything's good. Effects of climate change, the future of our world and its inhabitants, but that sounds weighty, doesn't it? Including the UN report from last month. You might have seen a news uh, summary of that. And then responding to climate change. This is not all going to be negative. We're going to talk about what we can do about it because what good is just uh, throwing our hands up uh, about problems. So this is the first question I always ask. Uh, which statement best represents your opinion? One, climate change is not a significant issue. Two, climate change is a modest level issue. Uh, three, climate change is a major issue. Four, climate change is major but not practical to address. So one is if you think it's a bogus issue, four if you think it's a hopeless issue, okay? And at this point, I don't show the, the audience the distribution because I don't want them to be affected by others. But every other question, I show the distribution of answers. And I will show you, since we, we don't have a way to poll here, uh, I'll show you the answer after a bit. And you can be on your honor if you want to keep track of how many you get right and Jack will make you a dessert or something if you if you win the, the number uh, correct. This one has no right and wrong answers. And then I ask this same question at the end, and then I'll show you statistics on how it changes uh, before and after. Okay, causes of climate change. It, it's one slide. Uh, and uh, this is uh, from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel, a panel on climate change, uh, the, the UN group that does this. And uh, the greenhouse, I really dislike that term, uh, the greenhouse effect, because there's no glass out there in space, right? Uh, but we do trap heat just like a, a greenhouse does. And when the sun comes shining down on the earth, uh, about 30% of the uh, sun's rays get bounced off clouds and deserts and shining water and goes into space. So it doesn't affect our, our climate or weather at all. But about 70% hits the earth, warms the earth, warms the water, melts the ice, and then it shifts, some of it shifts from the visible and UV, and this is as technical as I'll get, into the infrared. And if you see the red here in the infrared, and the issue with the infrared is most of that gets trapped in the atmosphere, uh, not uh, so much by the clouds, but by greenhouse gases. Grasses are, greenhouse gases are ones that absorb uh, infrared and they keep uh, uh, the energy from leaving the atmosphere, which warms the earth. Now, we have greenhouse gases. You all know about carbon dioxide. You may well know about methane, but water is the most important greenhouse gas. And uh, if we didn't have greenhouse gases, if our temperature was just a function of you got the Earth here, you got, I'm sorry, you got the Sun here, uh, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, we would be frozen. We're far enough away from the Sun that we, that on average we would be frozen. But these greenhouse gases that have been there for eons and eons, they keep the Earth warm to about 57, 58 degrees Fahrenheit. The issue is, as this atmosphere changes, and it is changing, and we'll look at that, as this atmosphere changing, we're we're holding more of the heat in. So instead of a greenhouse, a, a better uh, uh, analogy is a blanket. So we have a blanket around the earth that traps uh, sunlight energy. And now we're putting a second blanket on and we have an enhanced greenhouse gas. So that's as technical as I can get. I can answer questions later if you like. Okay, this is something from a hundred years ago, a newspaper in, in um, Australia. And it says the, the furnaces of the world burn over the whole world, 2 billion tons of coal a year. 
when it combines with the oxygen, you have 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide. It gains weight. Now, it said if we continue this way, uh, and these are called gigatons, by the way. Now we use the term gigatons. It said if this continues, the effect may be considerable in a few centuries. This is where the laugh track comes in because, of course, it's laughable. It only took one century. So keep this in mind. 100 years ago, we were putting at about 7 gigatons. You might think about how much we're doing now before I reveal it. We are now releasing 37 gigatons. We have in this 110 years increased from seven to 37, five times. There are people uh, still alive now who were uh, uh, alive about that time when it was 7 billion tons. And in the past 30 years, you can see it's increased over 60%. Uh, it's down in the 20 some here, went up about 3% a year when the go, go capitalism. And then 2008 crisis went down, COVID went down. But now in the estimates of 2022 is we've set a new record. Uh, so we haven't, haven't paid attention and lowered this. So here's a trivia question, right and wrong answer. China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. I hear that all the time. It's China's fault, okay? What am I gonna do? Uh, but what country is the second highest emitter? Okay, I'll give you a second. Of course, it's the good old United States. And uh, let's look at some data. This is the data of from 2021, the most recent that we have a full year. Uh, and China is the largest emitter. 11.5 of those tons are from China. We're the second highest, though, at five. Until 2008, we were the largest uh, emitter in the world. Now, you might say, well, then China's got twice the problem we have, so they need to do more than we do. And in fact, in many cases, they do. But it's not. And if you see here, you see Europe with 500 billion people, uh, five, sorry, 500 million people is uh, less than us, even though they're greater. India with uh, just about breaking the record in size in China is much less Russia and Japan. So uh, China and us are the two big leaders in terms of emissions. Now, a better way to look at it instead of total is per person. And this is again for 2021. The world average is about five tons. China is about eight. It's above average. Russia's 12, you know, burns off a lot of oil. Uh, Europe is less, and India is down here. The United States is not zero, it turns out. This is a trivia question. Looking at this scale, and you know that China emits about double what the United States does, what do you think it is per person, considering they're four times as large? Jack, did you take that advanced math class? I can't remember if that was part of your curriculum or not. Maureen's laughing, I think not. Okay, so China, it's about eight. What do you think it is for the United States? If you're keeping track at home here, the answer is 14.9. So 2,000 pounds. So every one of us is responsible for about 30,000 pounds of carbon dioxide going in the atmosphere. And here it is. There we are. We're the winner here. We're the winner here at uh, so much above e even uh, Russia. And in fact, we've been the leader like forever. All right. Uh, and we release 14.9 uh, tons of person, as I said. We're number one. Yay, there's something there. Huh? But we've improved since 2017. It was only 14.9. So we, we've gotten much better. But still, there's a long way to go uh, for us to get to reasonable level. Now, over history, and we got data going back over 100 years, oh, which country has released the most carbon dioxide in history? Check your answer. And the answer is, yes, the good old USA. And here's a figure that's a little hard to see. Uh, the green is North America, uh, Europe is orange, uh, Asia is red, et cetera. And in this uh, green area, you have the United States and of course, Canada and Mexico. You, our emissions have been 25% over all history. If you grab a carbon dioxide molecule in the atmosphere, 25% chance it came from the United States no matter where you are in the world. We're only 4.3% of the world, and yet we release 25% of the CO2. So it's really very much on our backs to deal with this problem, okay? Now, that's how much we've emitted. Now, what does the concentration look like? In chemistry, we love the concentration issues. Well, this is a curve going back to about George Washington's time, and the green is carbon dioxide readings from ice cores. So maybe you know about that. They drill down ice cores, and they melt by year, just like tree rings. And so this is parts per million. Don't worry about that. So by the George Washington time, it was about uh, uh, 280. The red is actually not ice cores. That's a, a top of a, a, a mountain in Hawaii, Mauna Loa. 
and a person has person and then his son took it on when he died uh, looked at it directly so the red are very accurate numbers where the green are rough numbers so i want you to think how old the oldest person you know is and i'm going to do this in a personal sense oldest person i know is there's my dear sainted mother uh born outside chicago actually 100 she'd be 100 she lived 96 of those years but she's been gone for four the CO2 level was 302 when she was born in 1922. When I was born, her first child, uh, uh, 26 years later, uh, it was 310. And you notice I'm wearing my Hawaii shirt just to keep up with the theme of the sensing CO2. Uh, the next I'm going to show is my son. Uh, my son, who was uh, born uh, 30 years later, uh, uh, 30 years after me, and it's 336. Now, of course, you know, I'm going to say next, I know you don't have the volume on, but you know, the next is going to be my grandchild, my first grandchild. That's Amabel. I know I'd hear some oohs and ahs if, the, you're, if you were unmuted. And that's and she was born 15 years ago, just turned 15 last month. And, uh, and she is one reason I've got started in studying climate change. I had the chance to do a sabbatical year in Washington, D.C. Uh, to work on this and develop resources. So if you see in one generation, it went from 302 to 310. One generation, 310 to 336, a big increase, and then 336 to 386. And this was 30 years, that was 30 years. And right now, uh, last month, it got to 420. So we've changed the atmosphere just from my mother's age, and there are people who are 100 years old now. We've changed it from 300 to over 400. We know from the isotopes, this is all humans doing this. And this is putting the extra blanket on. Okay, what are some of the effects? Uh, this is from the IPCC report last year, and this is temperature. And uh, this is going back to you know, roughly the year one, they use other things to determine uh, what the temperature was back then. But right now, the temperature is the warmest, it's warmest it's been in 2000 years. Okay, we had some ups and downs in temperature, but we've been almost steadily increasing over the past couple of decades. Let's look at a closer picture. And here this goes from 1850, you know, uh, uh, Civil War time, and it bounced around due to volcanoes and other things. But now the past couple of decades, it's definitely increasing 1.1 degree C, which is two degrees Fahrenheit. And this is what I mentioned. If a child has a, a two degree uh, fever, a parent deals with it. So I'm not preaching disaster, but I am preaching paying attention. If your child has a fever of two degrees, you need to pay attention to do something. We can't ignore it even if some people think we should. Well, seven of the eight warmest years of modern time have been since 2015. A fever that we can't ignore. So this I just downloaded yesterday. This is March. Uh, this is just last month. And as you see here, and the intensity of the color tells you how much this place is above or below average for that place at that time. So the Southern Hemisphere obviously is the opposite weather. This is 1.2 degrees C or 2.1 degrees C, so even more than one. And if you look at this, what you'll see is how uneven the distribution is. The poles in here, very much the North Pole, you don't see it as much in the South Pole, are typically where the biggest changes are. Some places are twice as much. I mean, Alaska it, it sets records in their temperature. And this, I just got an email five days ago from NOAA, National uh, Center on Environmental Information. Uh, this March was the second warmest March on record, as you saw, it went 2.1 degrees. So this is from a medical journal in 2021. You think of heat and floods and fires and stuff, but according to 230 medical journals, they got together and published uh, a summary and talked about the fact that the, the big problem in climate change is health, greatest threat to public health. And so it's important to keep us before one below 1.5 degrees C. And I'll show you a figure uh, related to that. Um, and they said that. Sorry. The question, yes. Yes, there's a question that popped up. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's when right. Say, Please do. Okay. Um, when the Earth's when you say the Earth's temp is that the the temperature of the air or the ocean water or what is that measuring? It's average. It's average of the two. So if you go on this, by the way, I'll be happy to send these slides to anyone. And on the bottom, uh, you'll go if you went to this slide here, uh, this slide here, you see at the bottom, and this is a NASA slide. You can go to that website and get that figure as I did yesterday. I updated from my last talk. So they have uh, it, just the air, just the land, just the water. Uh, this is a combination of them weighted by 
uh, how, how much uh, land and water we have. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, Great. I'm because uh, I can't see you. I'm kind of I can't see quizzical looks on your face, so don't hesitate to. <laughs> Uh, so this was in 2021, and this was a, a tropical storm, Henry. And that summer, one in three Americans experienced a weather disaster between June and August of that year. Um, this is from the IPCC report from last year. The CO2 concentration, I've just shown you a short section of it, it's the highest it's been in 2 million years. The Earth's been warmer before, but not because humans were here. Of course, we have, we've only been here a short period of time. Our path around the sun has changed, and our tilt as we rotate around our axis has changed, and that is called significant temperature changes over eons times. But CO2, the most in 2 million years, the sea level rise, it's not the highest, of course. I mean, lots of things, water was higher in the past, but it's the fastest rise, and it's tripled in recent time. And Arctic sea ice is the lowest in at least 1,000 years, and the glaciers are retreating at a rate unseen for 2,000 years. Okay, this is the report came out last month from the UN. That's the gentleman giving the report. And this is a New York Times summary of it. Uh, it's And the bottom line is that it's still possible to hold global warming to relatively safe levels. Uh, there is still one last chance. That's the, the most recent word, but it's only one last chance. And it, the, the goal is to keep us below 1.5 degrees. And I'll show you a little bit more about that later. Um, the original goal was to keep it under two degrees C, uh, which would be 3.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the goal is one and a half. And it says delays of even a few years will make it impossible to keep Earth at a comfortable level. So this is um, a slide from that report. Sorry, it's a little complicated. The color of the line is how many days in a year your temperature in the certain location will be unhealthy. That the heat and humidity is so great that uh, it poses a risk to mortality. And if we move up here, if it's if it changes by 1.7 to 2.3, you'll see some brown areas, which shows maybe 100, 150 days will be unhealthy. But if it uh, the purple ones showing almost every single day, if you live in those areas in South America or in Southern Asia, in the Pacific, almost every day will be unhealthy. And if we break by that and get two and a half to three degrees C, there's lots of places that the majority of days in the year, it'll be unhealthy to be outside. Recent hurricane, a medical report showed that the number one cause of death of one of the major hurricanes was not flood, uh, was not electrocution, or anything. it was heat, people not being able to keep themselves cool. Now you say put them in air conditioning, that's not practical, of course, and it generates more CO2. Okay, this is, this is the most complicated slide, so I'll just take a minute here. This is uh, emissions that you saw emissions before. This turns out includes more than carbon dioxide, so the numbers are a little different. As you saw, emissions went up and went down in 2008. And this is a slide, well, what do we have to do to keep it to 1.5 to, or 2? Well, this is red line is how much CO2 emissions have changed uh, just from in the nine years, 2010 to, to 2019. So it increased by 12%. Uh, so by that time, we weren't paying attention. The next, this red line is what in Paris, the Paris agreements that the United States signed, unsigned, and signed again, as you're following the news. Uh, this is what all the countries in the world say we can reduce this by, okay? But unfortunately, this is what will happen. Uh, this is what we need to do to keep it one and a half degrees C. We need to drop this fast within just a few decades, drop it down to essentially zero uh, for two degrees, uh, essentially zero and just a few more. But it turns out where we're at now, the things that we've really done, that's right here. What we've done is we have, if we don't do anything further, it'll be two to three and a half degrees C that the temperature increase. So we've, we've signed the Paris Accord. It's not enough. It's not enough. That only brings us, uh, us down a little bit. Okay, that's the last super technical slide. Okay, let's respond. What can we do? First, conservation, home insulation. The home I'm sitting in right now in Toledo, near the University of Toledo, uh, we moved here 20 years ago. Our previous house, which was uh, six, uh, and by the way, this is walking distance. I can walk there in about 25 minutes. Uh, the first home we lived in Toledo, we got here 35 years ago, was a very efficient home and to heat it in natural gas was costing maybe 120 
$130 a month in the wintertime, in the worst case. We moved into this home, which is somewhat older, uh, a little bit larger, but a brick home. And my first year, my heating bills were $400 a month because I, when they drilled into the wall, put a hole in the wall, there I won't say there was nothing in there. There was only air in there. Absolutely no insulation. The attic had a few inches, but not enough. The crawl space didn't have enough. So we spent some money, decent amount of money, and had it insulated. And now I just got, got a recent bill was like about $120 a month. So insulation pays for itself. That was like seven or eight years ago. I've saved that that money over. And of course, when somebody has the house after you, they're saving indefinitely. Next, a programmable therm thermostat. So you don't have to, you can get them essentially free now from your utility. You, you don't have to he uh, don't have to be warm all night long. Auto use. I, I drive a hybrid that gets 42 miles per gallon. But a key thing is how frequently you're taking trips. So uh, if you if your commute is uh, my commute is five minutes when I drive. If your commute is longer, or if you're taking more trips, and we'll look at it, how much you change by by just uh, changing your number of trips. But if you can live near the place that you drive most frequently whether it's your job. Now, if you've got two jobs in opposite directions, there's not much you can do. Uh, but where do you go? Where I'm here, I can walk to my church. I can walk to my office. Uh, I can walk to Starbucks, okay? It's in the next block. Um, so choices of living arrangements do affect how much you emit. More efficient appliances, particularly furnaces and air conditioners, okay? When they don't throw them out of now, but if they're you're replacing them, make sure you get very efficient ones. They pay for themselves. Recycling, I'll give you an example of that in a minute, and changing eating habits. And I'm going to dwell on that a bit. Uh, Teresa, I see there's some questions in the chat. Do you want to I can take a break here from my monitor? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, so someone mentioned it's interesting that, you know, as much as you're talking about the U.S. leading in emissions, that the movie that we watched ahead of this, most of the filming was of other countries besides the U.S. Mm-hmm. So not so much a question, more of a comment, but you know, if you have any any response to that. We are we are much less than China, but China is a much larger country. And uh and historically we, you know, we built up uh extensively. And Europe, I'm gonna look at Europe numbers in a minute. Europe has the advantage of being very compact. You know, they have a half a billion people in a size much less than the United States footprint. And so they they therefore use less energy and they use more public transportation and the like. So now these are figures, these are international figures that are released every November and I update these every November. Temperatures updated in January, emissions are updated in November. And you'll see the link, if you get these slides, you'll see the link, you can go there and you can check it out for dozens of countries and you can go back dozens and dozens of decades uh, to check what it is. Great, thank you. Was there another one in there? I, I see a four there. Um, that is it so far. It was, yeah, there's one from earlier and just a couple of uh, people who said just, yeah, responding to the, agreeing that it was interesting in the movie that the, the filming focused mainly outside the U.S. So. Is that the one, Maureen, that you sent me the link to? You, you sent me the name to? Yeah, it's a... No, that was a Nova one that I watched. It's just the uh, Aprophis, what is it? Aprophisy? Yeah, I don't know how it's pronounced. Anthropocene, the, Anthropocene, one, the yes. one on the canopy. And the Anthropocene, I, I did uh, watch a good a chunk of that, and it's it's broader than climate, and it's uh, uh, it talks about a lot of other negative in, environmental things. Uh, yeah. the, the movie that I, I might as well mention it now, the movie I really recommend on climate change, and fortunately you can get it at Amazon for old, only $2.49. It's not free, but uh, I don't know if the library loans it out. And I've actually given a talk on it. It's called From Paris to Pittsburgh. And it stouts when a, a particular president says, we don't want to deal with Paris, we want to deal with Pittsburgh. And then it jumps to the mayor of Pittsburgh and says, hey, we're really taking this seriously. And it shows homes still being built uh, right at uh, water level in Miami. Uh, and so that's a, it's a good movie to see, a good scientific movie and real, realistic. From Paris to Pittsburgh, you can get it from Amazon. Or it's also on Disney if you have Disney Plus. Oh, is it? I didn't know that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's where I started watching it. Okay, good, good. And, and when you finish watching it, send me a message, Mar uh, Maureen. Tell me what you think. I I showed it to a group. We had bought a DVD or something and mm -hmm. showed it to a group and then had a discussion of. I think they do a good mm -hmm. job of making it uh, re uh, real. 
Okay. The one on Nova is pretty interesting. It's more recent and it has a lot more to do with what we can do about climate change. Okay, well, I'll check that one out because you sent me the title of that one. Okay, one thing you can do is a programmable start a thermostat. As I said, cool the house at night. Another one which can save a marriage, I think, and maybe you're grinning here, is a dual control electric blanket. Now, that is not my wife, okay? I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, we just uh, recently celebrated our 51st anniversary, and I wouldn't make 52 if I had a picture of my wife sleeping as part of my talk. She has seen my talk numerous times, in fact. Couldn't get her to sit here in front of the computer. But the dual control, and it's, you know, her side may be five and my side may be 12. Actually, different times of life that was switched. We won't get into the biology there, but that does change over time, you know, if you can you know what I mean. But the point is, you only heat up the size of your bed and the rest of the house can get very cold because heating is one of your biggest uh, CO2 emitters. All right. Uh, not the biggest, but one of your biggest ones, as you can tell by how much money you pay. Okay. And this is from um, a report, United States Department of Transportation. And you see the, the link on the bottom as to where it is. Uh, the corporate, uh, the cafe standards, corporate average fuel economy by 2026 is 49 miles per gallon. So I get 42 in my, my car is about two years old. Uh, but it's going to have to go up the average. Uh, one of the issues in America is we're buying so many trucks. Almost half of all the vehicles that are bought by individuals, not business now, by individuals uh, is a truck. We need a truck because we're going to haul trash someday, right? And so we get uh, poor gas mileage. Well, we've been having these for a long time. And in fact, uh, since we've had them in 1975, uh, we've saved 25% less and 25% of the bar barrels of oil that we use by these CAFE standards, which are required in the whole country. California is a more strict one. That's a controversial thing. They just got the okay like a few days ago to again have more strict ones. Okay, recycling aluminum cans. And here's some chemistry. Uh, aluminum it comes from aluminum oxide, looks like sand. You get it off of the dirt someplace, the ground someplace, you pull the oxygen off using a lot of electricity. The oxygen's really held on there strongly. So you, you make aluminum and you make aluminum can. It takes a lot of electricity. I think it's the largest industrial use of electricity in the country is to make aluminum from aluminum oxide. But what you can do with aluminum, you know where I'm going here, you can recycle it. In fact, very visual here, you can recycle 19 aluminum cans for the same amount of energy it takes to make one new aluminum can. That's how inefficient it is to, to make aluminum. So if you see an aluminum can any place, put it in recycling because it's very easy to recycle. Other recycling is more complicated, this is not. And in fact, for each new aluminum can you make, you generate 25 gallons of CO2. Okay, here's a question and I know this group uh, will know the answer. Which of these foods produces the most greenhouse gases per pound to get it to your table? I think it's no secret, it's number four, it's beef. And in fact, here's a figure from a study done several years ago, and the uh, the y-axis is in kilograms, doesn't matter, it converts to, to grams as well. Lamb and beef are the highest emissions, okay? Partly because it's not just carbon dioxide, it's methane. Cows burp methane, and methane's worse than carbon dioxide. To get one pound of beef to the table, you generate 27 pounds of greenhouse gases. Whereas if you go down here, even to pork, <clears throat> the it's 12, it's less than half for pork. And for turkey, it's even less than that. And chicken, even less than that. Chicken is about one fourth. So if you're, if you're still set on eating meat, and I'm not a vegetarian, so I can't preach being a vegetarian, <clears throat> but if you're gonna have meat, <clears throat> use the one, the poultry is better and pork is not so bad, all right? And fish, depending where you are, you know, if you're far from the ocean, fish may not be very good. Most important thing is to not waste. When I first came to University of Toledo, and when I went to Quincy College back there in 1966 with my co colleagues here on this call, you had food trays. They don't use trays in cafeterias anymore because you're, as my mother would say, your eyes are bigger than your stomach and you take too much. And my stomach is big enough, okay? And uh, so uh, that was responsible, what, for a freshman 15 or 20? Uh, so now we don't have the trays. Students can go up as many times as they want but they can't take too much at once. Okay, now this is a little more complicated. Uh, colleague of mine from down at uh, Bluffton College, uh, we looked at 
electric vehicles versus gas, hybrid, et cetera. He looked at several. So I came up with the idea. He did the work. So we shared authorship here. You know, we got first author, though. So if you look at 700 vehicles and you look at how much CO2 they release per mile per pound of the car, you'll see that gasoline releases the most, diesel somewhat less, and hybrids quite a bit less, okay? Now, when people talk about electric vehicles, they say, well, wait a minute, it costs, you generate CO2 to get electricity. And that's true. And the number one determinant as to how much CO2 is produced to get your electricity is determined by which state you live in, which state you live in. If you live in California or in uh, New York state, which have a lot of alternate energy, waterfalls and solar things, you are any, any electric vehicle to make that electricity is much, much less emission than it is even with a hybrid. The U.S. average is, and this is several years ago, by the way, there's a very big study. And so we did, haven't repeated it because it's so time consuming. But even back then, and I'm sure it's better now, uh, any electric vehicle, average electric vehicle in the United States releases far less uh, CO2 to make that electricity. And if you're in some of these good states, now you'll see in these, like these are like the 10 largest states, Ohio is the worst. My good old Ohio that we're here, we actually had a big, uh, we just had a bribery uh, trial that the uh, um, state government uh, officials were convicted for bribery because they were getting paid money to help keep oil power plants open and nuclear power plants. So the point is electric vehicles are good. There are some grid problems. And of course you still have to charge it. Uh, one of my brothers lived in Madison, Wisconsin till Sunday and he just drove to Reno in his Tesla. Uh, and he uh, he used, uh, generates far less CO2 uh, for that uh, distance of 2000 miles than if he used a gasoline car. Okay, this just picked this out today. Solar is now 33% cheaper than gas, and it's way cheaper than uh, coal and oil. So solar is uh, is the way to go these days, solar and wind. And now this is from a local newspaper from last August. First Solar is a Toledo company. They're going to spend $185 million to increase their uh, places in Perrysburg and and uh, Lake Township near here, and a billion dollar factory in the southeastern United States. This company, First Solar, is the largest solar panel manufacturer in the whole Western Hemisphere, none bigger in North or South America. And they employ about 2,000 people, including some of our students, fortunately. So solar is, is definitely a financial deal, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, trivia question. I hope you're keeping track to see if you can get a dessert from Jack here. Which company is the largest producer of renewable purchaser, not producer, I'm sorry, largest purchaser by contract in the world? And the answer is the group, the place that we love to hate, Amazon. They are the uh, largest buyer of renewable energy. They take their solar fields that other people build and, and probably own, and they say, we will buy 100% of your uh, energy. Uh, these are called power purchase agreements. There are total in the United States, there are 235 gigawatts, I'll tell you what that is in a minute, of wind and solar capacity. These contracts with big companies are one fourth of all that already paid for. So they, they know there's going to be a, a consumer for it. A gigawatt, let's see, I can't quite see that because my control bar, oops, just a minute, my control bar is covering it. But 52 gigawatts, uh, let's see, can you read it? Uh, 235 gigawatts is like 100 million homes, almost half the homes in the United States. We can, just the homes, not industry and not cars, we can power by renewable wind and solar energy. Which country generates the most electricity from solar? And of course, this is... It's us. It, no, it's China. China produces more than we do. They're, they're the, you know, the biggest emitter. And they're still making coal plants. And how much from wind? It's also China. Uh, they they are they're good news and bad news. Their country is run by technical experts, okay, engineers and the like. Our country, I'll just say, is not. We'll leave it at that. Um, but unfortunately, people don't get to vote for them, and there are other problems. So when they make a decision like the one-child policy or the build more solar, they do it, whether it's right or wrong, they do it. And they've gone big. What they, their number one worry, as I understand it, is citizen unrest 
if there are two significant changes from climate change. If there's just too many problems from climate change. They already have a problem of air pollution, uh, particularly in Beijing, although it's getting better. And they're worried about civic unrest, and so they're investing heavily in alternate energy. They are the leaders. You can Google this stuff. And uh, uh, all right, now. Just a couple of questions or comments in the chat. Sure. All right. So Jack pointed out that in Kansas, 45.1% of our state electricity is from wind, which is third in the nation. So wow, that's, that's very good. Cool. One Number one, I think, is Texas, but it's a big okay. state. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool to know. And then someone else asks, what about the problem of lithium batteries? Okay, very good question. Very good question. First, the really good news is they're working on other batteries, batteries that are based on uh, sodium. And of course, sodium is all over the place, including on our skin and sodium chloride. Lithium is an issue for a couple of reasons, and you're right to raise it. One, of course, you know about the fire uh, hazard that it is. Why do we bother to use lithium? Because lithium is a very light atom, okay? And it transfers one electron for what, one mole, if you remember your mole stuff from chemistry. So it, it's lightweight in terms of carrying electricity, transferring electricity, but it does have some hazards. Now, of course, they're getting better at this all the time, uh, but lithium is still an issue. It's an issue for some of the cars. They, they've got to work in making it better and they are making it better. The other problem with lithium, as you may know, it's there's not too much in the United States. And often a lot of it is important, imported from South America or from China. The reason is because it was so cheap to import it from those places and it's expensive to do mining in the United States because we do in mining in the United States environmentally prudent, okay? But they are building, uh, I think we have some mine in this country and we're building more in terms of lithium mines. But the solution really is to go to sodium or some other substance uh, that doesn't have that hazard. But lithium is definitely an issue. Uh, I just read a figure today about the decades when you have a uh, a car battery, it's good for 30, 40 years, uh, uh, people question about replacing because they are very expensive. They're a big chunk of the cost of the car. They're a big chunk of the weight of the car, uh, but they last uh, as long as you typically would own a car. But lithium is an issue that we have to work on. You know, there's no perfect solutions here and there's no silver bullet for dealing with climate change. And that's good because there's not one target. You know, There's a whole series of targets. And in fact, depending on your drive, so most of my miles, I drive to Chicago to see our family, Chicago and Wisconsin, and my grandkids, and you saw one picture of one, are 637 miles away. So most of my miles are long distance. So the hybrid is not as, you know, it's still useful. You know, I told you my brother drives out west in, in a Tesla, um, but they're great for city driving, particularly hybrids, and uh, when you have electric vehicles that are, you can charge over the, overnight. But uh, since my commute to the university is a mile and my church and my store, just all a mile or two or three, I'm not a real candidate for electric vehicle. So I bought a hybrid instead and the hybrid gets 42 miles per gallon, which is you know still a good number. And other questions, I saw it looks like there's a number there. Yeah, well, I also posted the links for the uh, Paris to Pittsburgh on Disney Plus and on Amazon. And then someone else was just commenting that um, during the winter, uh, they they turn their heat down while they sleep to 60 and, you know, just put on a down comforter and stay stay nice and cozy that way. So. My physician says 65 degrees is the best temperature for sleeping. Uh, you don't want to be too warm. That's based on medical things. So this particular day, June of last year, California generated more renewable energy than they could use that day. They had an excess of energy that one day, but they do a very significant fraction other times. By the way, I said uh, Texas was the great, Texas is the largest producer of electricity by wind, okay? Uh, it's not the, the most highest percentage used. In fact, Texas, as you know, has a terrible problem with producing uh, energy. There are three electric grids in America. The Eastern part of the, Mississippi, the western part of the Mississippi, and Texas. Texas is its own grid, and that's why they had such big problems when they had winter a couple of years ago when uh, when it uh, things froze. Uh, now, this is about uh, personal responses to climate change. Uh, we're going to use a carbon calculator to see how much, by the way, we're about two-thirds of the way through. If you are, and I geared this to like college students, because most of my talks are to college students, if you're one person in a family of four, so your household generation of greenhouse gases, we divide by four. If you have an average size house, 
<clears throat> if you heat with natural gas and include air conditioning, and you drive about 1,200 miles per month in a small car, so I was gearing this to students, and you eat a heavy amount of meat, which some Americans do, and I'm going to look at what changes in this can do to improve your carbon footprint. And no airplane flights. I'll add airplane flights in, and I'll, I'll plead guilty to something in a bit. Okay, the carbon calculator on the bottom is a, a website. You can go on there. You click in how many therms you use of energy, how many kilowatt hours, what sort of things you eat. You can calculate, you know, and run scenarios. It's a it's a little complicated to use because it is so flexible. So you can check it out. This person that I just described, uh, first, let me go over here. Our country's footprint is 14.9 tons per person. We'd like to, get, of course, get it down to about two. But this person is, is more efficient than the average America. It's only 11.4 tons, okay? Now, the question is, what can they do to decrease it? Now, a fair amount of it comes from the house, fair amount from the car, even though it's a small car. Fair amount comes from secondary. That's where food is, okay? So if you keep this in mind, 11.4 metric tons, so uh, three, three and a half tons better than the average American. Which of these three things will you save most in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? Reduce your driving by 10%, reduce your overall food consumption by 10%, or reducing your meat from what's called relatively a high level to a low level. Which do you think will give you the most bang for your buck here in terms of changing. When I talk about reducing driving 10%, I say, if you drive 30 trips a, a month to church, to stores, to other things, you cut it down to 27, or maybe take a neighbor with when you go grocery shopping. If you just cut it by 10%, everybody can cut it by 10%. Every one of these things, by the way, you save money on, okay? It's not mentioned, you, but you can save money. Reducing meat from high to low. Meat really hammers the environment. And here are the pounds. Reducing driving for that small vehicle, 10%, 880 pounds. Reducing food consumption, 530. Going from high meat to low meat, 1850 pounds. Now, maybe you're medium, I don't know. So I'd put myself in the low category for meat uh, rather than high. And remember, your physician will tell you less meat is always a good thing. And it costs less, okay? Now, how much total do you save? If I'm putting a lot of things here together, if you cut your electricity by 10%, you know, change your light bulbs, uh, cut your natural gas by changing your thermostat, change your miles and go to a low amount of meat, how much total of that 9.4, I guess it was, that the uh, that the person had, which was uh, less than the American average, how much total just by these things, which everyone saves, everyone saves your money, some of them improves your health? Over 4,000 pounds. This is doable. And here's this new footprint now. Instead of uh, what was it? Oh, it was 11 point something now to 9.53. Okay. So a change of 4,100 pounds just by doing these relatively simple things. And this is per year per person in your household. Now, if you remember the figure before, and actually I can't see it because it's covered up uh, by my control bar here, is about uh, Europe was about six. Is that what it says there? Six point something. Now, I've actually lived in Europe. I was talking to Therese before that I lived near Hamburg for a semester on a professor exchange. And we all, I did a sabbatical in Paris many years ago. My wife and I moved our two kids to Paris for a year while I worked at a university. Uh, and they have much less emissions because they're higher dense con concentration of people. And because the concentration is so great, they have lots of, uh, um, of uh, public transportation. I've taken a train for at 196 miles per hour across France, okay? And they have, uh, they just have a lot of transportation going every place. Now, I said this was without flying. And now it's here where I will confess. Uh, uh, I, I think my two colleagues probably are the same priest for Western civilization, Father Francis Jerome, uh, in uh, Franciscan priest. And uh, <clears throat> I will confess here, confession good for the soul. I retired six years ago. And the next year I decided, Let's take the family to Disney, okay? So I have a son and daughter-in-law in Toledo with no children, just pets, my wife and I in Toledo. And then my son, whose picture you saw, and his wife, and they have five kids between them. They live on the East Coast. Or they live near Norfolk, Virginia. And they, <clears throat> at the time, they had a big van. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the seven of them in one van, very efficient, drove down to Disney. Okay, they did it like overnight. Well, the four of us flew out of Detroit. Detroit's just up the road here. And each of the four of us, generated for that round trip, uh, Detroit, Orlando, 
generated 1.77 tons in those two two-hour flights. Air travel is a real killer for, for climate change. Okay, now this is a, from last August. You've heard of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed, Congress. Uh, it's going to allow solar on the roof with a 30% tax credit to save $9,000 over, uh, uh, over the lifetime, $7,500 in tax credits for new electric vehicles, $4,000 for used uh, electric vehicles. Now, be careful. The law also says a certain percentage of it has to be made in the United States. I just saw an article on the uh, auto page of the newspaper that talks about which vehicles. There are a lot of vehicles qualify, but a lot of vehicles don't. So you have to check this out, Google it. And of course, you put an electric in your garage. One of the limitations of electric vehicles are apartment buildings where it's hard to get a, a, a lot of plugs in. Uh, but powering homes, business, and communities, clean energy by 2030, only seven years from now, this bill will help get 950 million solar panels, 120,000 wind turbines, and 2,300 grid scale battery plants. Because, of course, if you Wind is more at night and solar is more during the day, but you need to store the energy in some place. They are talking about using more people's cars in their homes to store. You know, if the car is there during the day, you could store the energy and uh, and then sell it back to the community. So there's ways to solve this. But they're building big, big battery plants. I mean, some of them are on on semis where they can have, travel around. Big battery plants. And this one bill will have 10 times the impact than any other single piece of legislation ever. It will reduce our emissions by 20%. You know, so it was about five gigatons in the United States. We'll reduce it by one gigaton by the things passed in this bill. It's over a series of years, of course. So money that is being really put to good use. Now, almost done. Best possible first step, and this saves you money, don't waste. Whether it's food, whether it's driving, whether it's keeping your lights on, <clears throat> and give you some, uh, now I'm going to ask the same question again, which statement best represents your opinion? One, climate change is bogus. Two, it's modest. Three, it's major. Four, it's major, but hopeless. Now, I'm going to show you this is, so I've given this talk, this is about 250 times I've given a talk like this. It's updated all the time. This is my fifth one in the past two months, and I've got one scheduled next week and, and next month. This shows with the clickers when I'm actually uh, getting people's votes, if you will, 108 presentations, 5,000 people that I've actually got data on. The red, the, the blue rather, is the opinion when they started. So about 60, a little over 60% said it's a major problem. And these were mostly college freshmen. I, I give like the last lecture in big college freshman classes. About 61% it says it's major. But after hearing like one class period of uh, good science, this goes up to about 81%, all right, and 743 people, these 5,000, changed their mind dramatically, okay? And even those who say it's bogus has gone down, but those who say it's hopeless has gone down, because of course I'm giving some reasons, things that you can actually do. Next one, now this is hand over your heart and raise your right hand. Are you willing to reduce your emissions by conserving, recycling, changing your eating habits? One, I will modestly reduce. Two, I will significantly reduce. Three, it will be difficult to reduce. Four, I see no need to reduce my emissions. Now, I gave this uh, a talk, a predecessor talk to the on Earth Day, which is coming up, you know, April 22nd, uh, to, to the environmental student group at, at the university. And there were probably some bicycling vegans in there, okay? You're supposed to smile when I say bicycling vegans, okay? Uh, and for them, it would be hard for them to change their emissions. So let's see what these 5,000 people said uh, about... Uh, 75%, 4,000 said they will modestly or significantly, look at the number of people, they will significantly make changes based on one hour. I mean, this is like a, um, what do you call it? Uh, tent revival thing, but but for climate. Uh, 4,000 people of the 5,000 that I spoke to, 5,500 said they would make some change in their life. Now I got, I'd have to keep their, get their phone numbers to call them back and see if they did that after the, a period of time. But the point is science convinces people it's real. Uh, there's a group at Yale that has a climate education center, and they've interviewed me about my, my fever analogy, but they say America is divided up into six categories of people. The ones who are very, very concerned about climate uh, is a certain percentage, and those who say it's bogus, I'm not doing anything. You know, the bottom 10%, it's not worth talking to them or being aggravated or them aggravating. You know, treat them with respect, 
but don't but there's a lot of people in the middle who one hour of science will tell them i need i have some responsibility my ancestors in this country have responsibility it's time to do some things okay what else can you do almost the last slide Tell your friends and family members about what you've learned. Start conversations. I didn't get invited to Lawrence to do this, but this is fine. I can do it from Toledo. There's no, no CO2 involved except a little bit of electricity. Um, ask me to speak to them. I definitely will do it uh, by Zoom. Uh, and if it's close enough, I'll, I'll do it in person. Um, and be an informed voter. Uh, I gave this talk at the University of South Carolina a, a couple of years ago, and there's about 250 people in the audience. Didn't have enough clickers for him, in fact. And one young fellow stood up and he looked to be old enough to be a graduate student. And he says, well, you know, what sort of things we can do? I says, your generation didn't vote in that 2016 election, okay? And that's why we're dealing with some of the problems now about getting out of the Paris Accords. So be an informed voter. And that's that's important every single cycle because there are some people who say it's serious and some people who say it's bogus. And almost final here. The next generations need us to respond. I know my friends Jack and Maureen here have kids and grandkids. Those are my grandkids, okay? Uh, are you going to tell them you can't give up uh, beef more than, you know, once a month or so? Uh, the tallest is 18, and that's a child of my uh, uh, of my uh, daughter-in-law. And uh, this boy here is from her also, as is this 10-year-old. And this is my granddaughter. You saw her picture when she was first born. And that's my uh, grandson, uh, Andre. Uh, and they... Uh, so these five kids and your kids and grandkids, this is the world they're going to live in. In fact, if Emma Bell, she was born in 2008, and I started working on this in the summer of 2008 because she was born. I said I had time to, to, to go to Washington to spend a year to work on this. If she lives as old as my mother, her, her great-grandmother, she'll be alive in 2100. And the predictions for 2100 are very, very dire. I didn't even cover them here. They're very, very dire. Sea level going up at least three feet, maybe six feet, okay? Um, and uh, so the life that they will be living in is one that we're preparing for them. And this is something we need to prepare better. So finally, uh, uh, credit slides. This has uh, been funded by both NSF and NASA to grade these. I'm not funded by anybody right now. I'm not sending an invoice for this, Teresa. Don't worry. This is all. No extra charge. Uh, this is a website. Uh, CAMEL is an acronym. Uh, Climate Adaptation Mitigation E-Learning. To get money from NSF, you got to come up with an acronym in effect. And there are 300 lessons on here, all available free. Uh, we, we don't have continued funding, so we don't have a tech person keeping them updated. But there, there's an ice core here you see on the lower right to check the ice core in Vostok. It's a place in Russia. Finally, there are the um, uh, acknowledgments for people who have helped in this, including NASA and NSF. And then I have extra slides after this. So have at it. Answer any questions you want. How was that? That was not quite an hour, but I'm happy to talk for as long as there are questions. Do you want me to take this off the screen and so I, we can see yeah, everybody? That, that would be easier, Andy. Thank you. Okay, sure. Are there any questions uh, from the chat? And we don't have that large a group. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, that would be great. One question I had was, um, you know, sometimes I think what prevents me from uh, digging into these issues is like checking out books here at the library, for example, on the topics. I'm like, oh, I should read this, but it's going to be really depressing. Do you have any like a suggestion for just, you know, a couple of books that maybe delve into the science, but also offer some hope and solutions that would be appropriate for non-scientists? Well, I, I have one. In fact, I've taught it when I was in Germany. I was a professor of exchange. I said, and I taught a course in climate change, not to Germans, but there were American students studying German. And it's a book written by the, one of my colleagues I worked with on this project, but it's a bit, it's pretty out of date right now. That was nine years ago. So let me research that and get back to, if you don't hear from me in a couple of days, Teresa, send me a reminder. That's a very good question. Uh, a lot of this is not in books because it gets outdated so, so quickly. But um, there are organizations that are very good at uh, uh, providing information. Uh, Climate Reality Project, uh, National Resources Defense Council do very good things. By the way, I, I, all my slides are reputable groups. Greenpeace probably does good things, but I wouldn't use a slide from Greenpeace. Every one of these is a 
a published paper or a US government or the UN or a, um, a newspaper article in which I've given the reference. So it, a lot of books aren't really the, the best way to get at this sort of thing. Uh, but looking at, uh, there's a website and I can send you a link, a link of some websites. Uh, there's one, um, take me a minute to think of it, but it also has the 10 uh, most common uh, misunderstandings about climate change. And then it, uh, and it gives lots of details about why those are misunderstandings. Okay. 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 It's like Maureen has a question. Yeah. yeah um, the, the talk is is great as far as what we can do and and not making things worse. Do you also give a talk on how to clean up the problems that are already here? Uh, no, I I um I give a talk about energy, by the way, sources and and uses of energy. But um, if you're talking about environmental, I mean, I've taught a class on environmental chemistry, which includes, of course, some some cleanup things. Um, are you talking specifically air or re reduce? I mean, the number one thing to get CO2 out of the atmosphere is to the stuff that's already there. How do we get it out of there? What's this magic thing that'll take in CO2 and give off oxygen? It's called a tree. A tree. A tree. <laughs> that's what trees do. Yeah. Trees and anything green takes the energy from the sun, it pulls in carbon dioxide, and it releases oxygen. It's a magic thing almost, you know, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Uh, plant trees. And we planted recently what I just saw a figure of how many point some billion trees that have been planted recently. There's a group that's planting a billion trees going across Africa under, you know, not quite at the midpoint of Africa. So, uh, you know, the best pl time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. The second best thing time is tomorrow. Okay. To plant a tree. <laughs> You all okay. euphemisms at no extra charge. Any, any other, uh, any further questions? Okay, well, if you uh, want to unmute and uh, show some appreciation with some applause, I think Andy did a pretty good job, made things fairly simple. Uh, not that it's a simple problem, but at least made it a little simpler for us to understand a very difficult problem. So thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. It's wonderful. Yeah, Thanks. we Come will. Uh, we will. We will gather. We will obviously have this film, and. Uh...